At this point, we know Mafia bosses usually meet very brutal ends, but Mafiosos aren't really any better either. You might think that Mafia snitches could have a better life because they have the law's protection, but that's not the case at all. We'll show you how these Mafiosos were mercilessly killed, because nobody likes a rat, do they? Abe Kid Twist Rayless The first on our list is Abe Rayless, the violent gangster who turned into a snitch. Abraham Rayless was born in the Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. Abe attended school until the eighth grade. After leaving school, Abe started hanging out at pool halls and candy stores in and around Brownsville. It wasn't long after he began frequenting these establishments that he encountered two of his childhood pals, who later joined him in the gang known as Murder, Inc. His friends went under the identities of Martin Goldstein and Harry Strauss. His first encounter with the law was in 1921, just after Prohibition had begun. He was detained after taking $2 worth of gum from a vending machine. Abe Rayless was fairly short, yet it didn't stop him from perpetrating heinous acts of violence. When conducting killings, he used an ice pick. He would ram the ice pick through his victim's ears and into their brain. Yikes. He became increasingly crazy and aggressive over the years, and once in broad daylight, he attacked a worker at a car wash for failing to wipe a smudge from his car's fender. Another allegation from about the same time said that Abe Rayless killed a parking lot attendant for failing to get his car quickly enough. Kid Twist is named after an earlier New York killer, Max Kid Twist Zerbeck. Other stories suggest that it was the name of his favorite candy, or even the way he killed people. During Prohibition in the 1920s, Abe was still a teenager. He and a companion ended up working for the Shapiro brothers, who ran many of Brooklyn's rackets. This was to be Abe's first step on the criminal ladder, as he started committing minor crimes for the brothers. Oh, and by the way, an interesting fact. While being a bootlegger, he rarely consumed alcohol. Eh, small sidestep. Let's continue. Abe was arrested once and sentenced to two years in a juvenile institution. The Shapiro brothers did nothing to assist Abe, which he couldn't forget and marked the beginning of his revenge plot against them. Shortly after getting free, he formed an alliance with a few friends, including George DeFeo, who had connections to Meyer Lansky. Meyer Lansky sought access to Brooklyn's poorest neighborhoods and chose to strike a deal with Abe Rayless and company. This proved to be one of Abe's most successful times, as both his party and Meyer Lansky fared well. Trouble with the Shapiro brothers Their success eventually caught the attention of the Shapiro brothers, who placed Abe Rayless and his partner on their death list. One evening, Abe Rayless received a call from an alleged acquaintance who had informed him that the Shapiros had left their headquarters. Abe Rayless, George DeFeo, and Goldstein all left their car and headed to the Shapiros' headquarters. But it was a trap, and all three were injured but not killed. One of the Shapiro brothers then abducted Abe Rayless' girlfriend, transported her to an open field, and raped and wounded her. Of course, this was the final straw for Abe, so he solicited the support of his Murder, Inc. family who saw potential in taking over the Shapiro business as well. Irving Shapiro was the first to be hit. Abe dragged him out of his home and onto the street, where he was kicked, beaten, and eventually shot several times. Two months later, Meyer Shapiro, who had battered and raped Abe's girlfriend, he met Meyer on the street and fatally shot him in the face. Finally, the third brother, William, arrived three years later. William was pulled off the street and nearly beaten to death before being placed in a bag, still alive, and brought to an isolated location where Abe Rayless proceeded to bury him. However, a passerby interrupted the proceedings, and Abe left the scene. William Shapiro's body was excavated shortly thereafter, and following an autopsy, it was discovered that he had been buried alive. Abe the Rat Abe's 1940s didn't start so well, as he was implicated in a series of murders. To avoid being executed, Abe Rayless became a government witness. He then chose to incriminate his boss, Louis Buchalter, in the murder of Brooklyn candy store owner Joseph Rosen, for which he was later killed. Next, he accused Harry Pittsburgh Phil Strauss, Mendy Weiss, Harry Happy Mayoni, Frank the Dasher Abandondo, and even his former schoolmate Martin Bugsy Goldstein. Needless to say, they were all convicted and executed. A step too far. Next on Abe's hit list of consequences was Albert Anastasia, Murder, Inc.'s co-chief of operations. This, however, was too much for Abe Rayless, because Anastasia was a high-ranking Cosa Nostra member. Abe intended to incriminate Anastasia in the murder of Union docker Pete Panto, 
and the trial was set for November 12, 1941, with only Abe Raylis' testimony to go on. As you can imagine, with Abe out of the picture, Anastasia walks free. And with such support and the New York crime family's exposure on the line, Frank Costello, head of the Genovese crime family, was able to raise $100,000 to have one of Abe Raylis' bodyguards killed. Abe Raylis was discovered dead outside his hotel on November 12, 1941, early in the morning. Many believe he died after being thrown from a hotel window, but others believe he was actually trying to run away. However, the way he landed and the trajectory indicates that he was pushed. Abe Raylis earned the nickname, the canary who could sing but couldn't fly, as a result of his snitching and the manner in which he died. Joseph the Animal Barboza Another one of those snitches who met a cruel end was Joseph Barboza, so settle in, because this snitch really got what he deserved. Joe the Animal Barboza, a notorious hitman and intimidator for Raymond Patriarca's New England Mafia, was set up by his old friend James Chalmus in San Francisco's Sunset District. When Barboza left Chalmus's residence, he was shot four times by Patriarca family underboss Gennaro Jerry Angelo and mob soldier Joseph Russo. The FBI later identified the two men responsible for Barboza's murder. Barboza had agreed to testify against both Angelo and Patriarca in 1968, and the Federal Witness Protection Program was created to safeguard him. He became the first Cosa Nostra associate to provide testimony in court against the mob. Born in 1932 to a family of second-generation Portuguese immigrants, Barboza developed into a Hollywood caricature of a mob thug. He worked as a gang enforcer in Loan Shark, earning $5,500 a week on cash loans given out to gamblers and others. In 1965, when Patriarca allied with Irish and independent ethnic mobsters, the bloody McLean-McLaughlin gang war raged in Boston. Barboza used his talents to blunt the work of the independents and claimed to have killed 26 people during the three-year war that claimed nearly 50 lives. In 1966, Barboza was arrested on gun charges and expected to post a $100,000 bail. When some of Barboza's crime associates raised more than $80,000 to put towards it, Patriarca had three men killed and their money taken. Barboza then agreed to turn as an informant in exchange for immunity, safety for his family, and to get even with the mob. Barboza was involved in one of the most shocking miscarriages of justice ever perpetrated by the FBI. He lied under oath against six defendants accused of the 1965 murder of minor league hood Edward Teddy Deegan based on uncorroborated and perjured testimony. State prosecutors won convictions for the six men who the FBI and Barboza framed. Two defendants received life sentences, while the other four received the death penalty. The FBI protected Barboza's close friend, Jimmy the Bear Flemmy, from state murder charges in Deegan's homicide. In 2002, the House Committee on Government Reform looked into the FBI's use of Barboza, Jimmy Flemmy, and other murderers as federal informants. In a scathing 1,800-page report released in 2004, the committee stated that Barboza and Jimmy Flemmy killed Deegan, but Hoover and the FBI allowed the innocent defendants to take the fall. The FBI played a devil-you-know game with irrational and dangerous criminals in hopes of gathering evidence against the top bosses, with embarrassing consequences for the agency. The Barboza saga worsened before his death in 1970, when he shot and murdered Clay Wilson, a small-time crook. The pressure worked in his California state court case, and Barboza got five years to life on a reduced second-degree murder charge. In his first parole hearing, the Fed sent more character witnesses to argue for his release, and it worked again. Barboza was released from prison in November 1975. He relocated to San Francisco. Four months later, shotguns fired on instructions from the Patriarca family brought a stop to the whole charade. Barboza's death would have pleased Patriarca, who was freed from prison in 1974 after serving only four years for Marfeo's murder and died of natural causes at his paramour's home in 1984. Alfredo Freddy the Sid Sant Antonio On July 11, 1963, two guys disguised themselves with makeup and entered the Flowers by Charm flower shop at 197 Avenue T in Brooklyn, New York. They approached the store owner behind the counter and fired five rounds at him before fleeing. Alfredo Sant'Antonio, a 40-year-old Gambino crime family member, was left dead on the floor. The murder bore the characteristics of a professional killing. The shooters took nothing, and Sant'Antonio's father-in-law, who was inside the shop, was unharmed. 
police ruled out any relation to the gallo profaci War, which was happening in Brooklyn between various factions of the organization led by Joseph Profaci. But investigators quickly determined that it was a mob hit. Authorities had sentenced Sant'Antonio to eight years in prison for selling stolen bonds over 18 months before. He was shot down while appealing his conviction. Gregory Scarpa, a Colombo crime family member who had begun secretly helping the Federal Bureau of Investigations the previous year, stated that it was common knowledge in Brooklyn that Sant'Antonio was killed because he was cooperating with the government. Scarpa revealed that Mafia leaders had planned to use Sant'Antonio's murder to undermine informant Joseph Valanci's scheduled testimony before a U.S. Senate committee investigating organized crime. According to Scarpa, the federal government was planning to back up Valanci's testimony with testimony from Sant'Antonio. Bosses hoped that by killing Sant'Antonio, the authorities would not be able to use Valanci now because we got rid of their corroborator. The FBI never publicly acknowledged Sant'Antonio's involvement, despite press reports claiming the Mafia most likely murdered him for cooperating with investigations into narcotics and counterfeiting activities on the East Coast. However, freshly disclosed FBI intelligence data indicated that between 1962 and July 1963, Sant'Antonio discreetly provided significant information under the informant symbol code NY3864. Eugenio Jean Giannini Eugenio Giannini, a notorious criminal, began his career in New York City as a teenager and later worked as a supervisor in high society restaurants. He was involved in several robberies and was sentenced to five years in Danamora for carrying a gun. In 1934, he shot a policeman during an inspection, killing him and three other bystanders. Giannini was never charged. Before entering the underworld, Giannini worked as a supervisor in high society restaurants, protecting guests from harassment and monitoring the kitchen. He then entered the betting business, especially horse racing and the drug trade, where he was caught and sentenced to 15 months in 1942. During his detention, he met Lucky Luciano, the former head of the Genovese family, who had been in prison since 1936, but still had good contacts with the outside world. After the war, Giannini set up a smuggling ring for penicillin from the U.S. to Italy and brought false U.S. dollar bills into circulation in France. However, he was betrayed by one of his helpers and the process failed. Giannini was recruited as an informant during his imprisonment by the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, a sub-agency belonging to the U.S. Treasury, combating the emerging trade in hard drugs. In 1950, when smuggling penicillin and other goods to Italy again, he was caught by the police in Naples with a large sum of counterfeit money. He was imprisoned in Poggio Reale prison and contacted the head of the FBN, Charles Siragusa, who promised him information about Lucky Luciano, who had lived in Naples since his deportation to Italy in 1947. This information succeeded in persuading Italian authorities to release Giannini, who returned to the USA. Luciano learned of Giannini's offer and passed the information on to New York City. Despite tension between Vito Genovese and Luciano, this led to Giannini's death sentence. The hit contract was delegated to Tony Bender, alias Anthony Strollo. On September 20, 1952, Giannini was gunned down in East Harlem by Joe Valacci and brothers Joseph and Pasquale Pagano, along with Fiore Fury Silano, acting as an accomplice. Dominic the Gap Petrilli Dominic the Gap Petrilli was a former member. He earned the nickname The Gap after losing two front teeth in a childhood battle. Petrilli met Joseph Valachi at Sing Sing Prison in Ossining, New York. In 1928, after Valachi was freed from prison, Petrilli introduced him to Girolamo Bobby Doyle Santucci and Tom Guyano. Petrilli was a former driver and bodyguard for Tommy Guyano, the syndicate's Don who preceded the crime family's namesake, Tommy Three Finger Brown Lucchese. In 1942, Petrilli was convicted of narcotics and exiled to Italy. He returned to the United States in November 1953. He was assassinated by three assailants on December 9, 1953, while sitting on a bar stool in the Bronx. Rumors circulated that he was helping law enforcement after returning from Italy, where the narcotics lieutenant had been deported a decade earlier. On the street, it was commonly assumed that at the time of his death, Petrilli had exchanged information on his fellow criminals and mobsters in the Lucchese crime family in exchange for the U.S. allowing him to return to New York. Whitey Bulger Anyone who has seen a mob movie in the last decade or so will undoubtedly be familiar with the name Whitey Bulger. 
Bulger is, or was, a notorious Boston-area gangster turned FBI informant who not only helped federal investigators apprehend numerous high-profile members of rival criminal families, but also spent 16 years on the run after being informed of his own impending indictment. During his 12 years on the run, he was ranked second only to Osama bin Laden on the FBI's most wanted list. Following his arrest in 2011, Bulger was sentenced to two consecutive life terms on charges of racketeering, money laundering, and extortion, as well as charges stemming from his confirmed involvement in 11 killings. Since then, Bulger has been imprisoned in Florida, almost without incident. However, he was later transported to a West Virginia facility. A day later, he was dead. The victim of one of the most horrible and bloody prison murders you'll hear about in a long time. Bulger, whose narrative inspired The Departed and was more starkly depicted in Black Mass, was allegedly slain by fellow convicts just hours after arriving at the jail in Hazleton, near the Maryland border. CCTV footage obtained inside the prison purportedly shows four inmates entering Bulger's cell at 6 a.m. local time and exiting shortly after with their clothes bloodied. Their claim to have returned to their cells, changed out of their bloody clothes, and returned to Bulger's cell with a mop to clean up the mess. The purported details of the murder, however, are the most absurd. According to the sources, Bulger was viciously assaulted with a sock stuffed with a lock. His assailants are reportedly said to have attempted to gouge out his eyes with a shiv and cut out his tongue. The heinous murder recalls the mob days of the 1930s and 40s, when eye removal was used as a retaliation against spies and the tongue removal was utilized against snitches. Bulger's alleged murder had all the elements of a mob vengeance hit, something not seen in a very long time. Preliminary inquiries point to mob hitman Photius Freddy Giaz as the perpetrator of the attack. Giaz was already serving a life sentence without parole for the 2003 murder of a Massachusetts crime boss and had exhausted all of his appeals. Combine that with the fact that West Virginia does not use the death penalty, and conducting a mob revenge hit in prison is essentially a free hit for him. Giaz reportedly is the last of a dying breed of mafia enforcers. He despises both snitches and those who mistreat women. Bulger ticked both boxes. As a result, according to sources, Giaz is now a rich man who can run any prison he's in. Mafia snitches may have hopes of a better future, but once you're involved in the life of crime, you can never turn your back on it. It follows you to the grave. Even if it was just a mistake, it's a road where there are no U-turns and no way back.